Welcome to the latest episode of the C-Suite podcast that we're producing in partnership with SNP, a world-leading data transformation company. My name is Russell Goldsmith, and on this show, uh, we're going to be exploring how companies are embracing innovation, metrics, and data to meet the challenges of today and tomorrow. We want to find out how businesses are using digital solutions to make sound strategic decisions in an ever-changing complex world. And to this end, I'm delighted to introduce my two guests, Shobi Ramakrishnan, uh, the Chief Digital and Technology Officer at GSK. And uh, Shobi has actually kindly invited us to record the show at GSK's offices. So thanks very much for that, Shobi. Um, alongside Shobi is Alex Smith, the Director of Strategy and Solutions at SMP. So welcome to you both. Um, I'd love to kick off the discussion, obviously, to get an introduction to both of you, but also to hear what drew you to data, algorithms, and analytics in the first place. Um, Shelby, let's come to you first. Yeah, it's very good to be here uh, with you. Um, so I was trained as a hardware engineer, an electronics engineer, and um, much of my uh, initial work was in uh, research and development for television monitors and computer monitors. And as I was sitting there one day uh, programming a microcomputer that sits inside a, a monitor, I had this sense that I love uh, algorithms and software development a lot more than I loved circuits and hardware. So that started my natural foray into software as a source of impact for business. And then as the you know level of digitization just progressed exponentially, a natural foray then into data and analytics as a vector of impact for our business outcomes as well. Alex? So, um, slightly different journey towards mm -hmm. data, but I started as a fresh-faced analyst in a large consultancy company, thinking I'd be changing the vision of a, a board of directors in a shiny suit. Um, but I ended up very quickly doing um, data analytics. And what I mean by that is data strategy, cutover, migrations. And I did that over and over again, looking at spreadsheets and vast amounts of data. But I suddenly realized, and my manager, uh, who I'm still in contact with, told me at the time, if you understand the data of a business, you understand the business. Now, it was a bit of a punt, because obviously data is coming into you know, the limelight now, but it's been quite a while, I have to say. Um, but yes, I started out um, looking to management consult and actually did that through data in my career. So combining both you know, strategy enterprise information management with with data so it's been a really interesting journey well data is is the key part of uh, this episode we, we've titled it data driven decisions the business advantage alex let's stick with you what does uh, making data driven decisions mean to you well to make a decision you need to be informed you need to have good knowledge and confidence in your information now that requires good data and data needs to be a reflection on the reality of the situation, whether it's the industry, um, in, in the instance of GSK, the results, the trials. But those decisions are ultimately taken by a confidence that the chain of data all the way through up to that what you're seeing in, on the interface you're looking at it with it can give you the answer, or at least the, the confidence to make the mm. decision. Mm. Shelby? Yeah, uh, I fully agree with uh, what Alex just said. And I think the... Uh, data has always been an inherent part of businesses. So in our industry, we use scientific data to make uh, discovery decisions. We use clinical data throughout the clinical development process. Our regulatory filing and approval is based on data, etc. We make supply chain decisions daily and we make commercial and sales and marketing decisions. What I think is the new frontier that we are all pushing against, and I think Alex described it very well. He started with a business problem, then to realizing the potential of data, and then using data at scale. The frontier that we are all pushing right now is this power of combining the uh, data-based insights uh, that we get with the power of automation because compute is available at scale and really integrating it into the core of our business. That's what we're getting to you know, go, go more ambitiously uh, in search of what we mean by data-driven decisions mm. in, the, in this day and age. Yeah. Obviously, delighted that you you know, took our invitation to come and, and, and join this conversation for the, for the podcast. But what we're keen to understand is why is this conversation so relevant to you, you know, right now at this moment? And also, how crucial is this period for you at GSK? Um, it's really important to understand who we are and why we exist. Uh, we are a global biopharma company, and we make medicines and vaccines that prevent and treat disease. 
and we have an ambition to reach and positively impact the lives of 2.5 billion people on the planet by 2030. And that's an enormous ambition uh, for us. And if you think about the biotechnology industry, 2026 is the 50th anniversary of uh, biotechnology. It's a fairly new science and new technology. However, the next decade is going to be shaped by uh, the intersection of biology and technology. And therefore, uh, putting technology at the core of our business and how we discover medicines, how we develop medicines, and how it ultimately helps, uh, you know, helps uh, reach patients, I think is a really important uh, element of our strategy. And so we've said that our company's purpose is to unite science, technology, and talent to get ahead of um, disease together. And uh, we have the privilege of doing it with some amazing scientists and amazing technologists and amazing business leaders in our company. Alex, how, how excited are you about this kind of next decade and, and also the possibilities for innovation and, and problem solving? I think Shavi did a very good job of explaining why we're, we're all excited about this. But to kind of add some points, I think, you know, technology has always supported the business. And I think, you know, if you look at biotech as an example um, and some of the startups um, that we've seen over the last, I'd say, you know, five or ten years, the predictive analytics and machine learning of pre you know, preventative um, health problems, let's say in the diabe diabetes type 1, type 2 space, you know, that kind of learning of how you might harness technology to drive business outcomes and value or outcomes for patients more importantly, that's where technology is at the core. It's the start of the journey and it's hand in hand with what you develop. It's not a supporting aspect of, of, of the business and I think that's where strategy now, and I've seen it um, in a number of instances, is around information, people, data, outcomes. It's not just about the process and, and how we might do things in an old way. It's agile thinking. And I think, you know, the ability to be agile and, and direct your business from, you know, and support it with technology, not being the anchor, being the driving force is the very exciting part of this. AI, it's amazing stuff. Um, I think we might come on to that later in the discussion about where it is versus where we think it's going. But, you know, combining all of the, let's say, data, technology and platforms that are available within the strategy is, is very exciting. I mean, you both gave your background in terms of, you know, what you've studied, you've trained for and, and you know, your experience. But is, is, is now a time, did you ever see the speed of, of development being as quick as, as it's happening right now? I mean, show me what... Uh, I I think um, the simple answer is no, but it also is sort of normal now. I think um, I've lived my entire career in Silicon, uh, Silicon Valley, so things always moved fast. Um, you know, Apple turned itself around from being a company that was nearly bankrupt to the mega um, uh, company that we see today. Um, you know, Google and Meta didn't exist, uh, you know, a few decades ago. And I think it's always been pretty fast, but I believe that the rate of acceleration continues to really increase. And it, uh, it especially what's happened with generative AI has surprised almost all technologists in the past year yeah. or so. Yeah. Yeah, to segue on from that, I think it, there is an element of surprise. You know, exponential graphs keep getting faster, and it has, has been fast. But, yeah, the introduction of, you know, um, that aspect of AI, generative AI, um, you know, automation of, 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 of tasks, uh, interaction with customers, you know, that human-centric interaction has been phenomenal to the point where, you know, I, I think if we look at regulation being a, an aspect of what we're looking at with AI, you know, like anything, le le legislation, um, regulation is struggling to keep up because of that speed. Is how do we handle this? How do we protect? How do we govern? And that's an indication potentially of, of its speed. You know, how do we you know, tread carefully, develop properly? You know, make sure the foundation is set correctly. Well, Shelby, let's. I'm keen to get in, kind of like dig a little deeper into the into the meat of this discussion. Um, so let, let's kind of focus on your role if that's okay and kind of understanding the priorities that you have but also be interesting to understand what KPIs you're working towards and also how you track those through obviously data. Yeah um, very happy to answer I think our strategy is to really uh, deliver transformational medicines and vaccines so uh, we have uh, I 
I say that we don't have a technology strategy, but we have a business strategy that allows us to try, thrive in a digital world. So it's very natural that the technology priorities and KPIs that we've set is directly lined up the, to the business priorities and business KPIs that we have as a, a company. And uh, therefore, I have four priorities. The first one is to think about how data and technology, and particularly AI and machine learning, can accelerate and amplify our drug discovery and clinical development process. So we are trying to take each of those areas uh, to the next frontier of impact and speed. Um, uh, we are an industry where uh, over... 90% of our ideas fail. Only 10% of our ideas make it to the make it to the, to becoming a medicine, and therefore we can use all the help we can get in our in our research and development. And our second priority for us is to think about how our supply chain and manufacturing, which is rapidly adapting to our new portfolio of medicines that are emerging, can benefit from all the digital innovation that's occurring in supply chain and manufacturing, particularly with data and AI as well, um, but also um, uh, what we call Internet of Things and all these sensors that provide enormous amounts of data and insights to the manufacturing process. So we want to really be at the uh, forefront of benefiting from the digital uh, revolution that's happening in manufacturing as well. So we call it our Smart Manufacturing 2030 vision that, we are, that, that we've uh, set our uh, compass on. Uh, a third element is ultimately competitive advantage in how we think about engaging our customers, uh, how we help our field force be effective. So we think quite a bit about making sure that our investment in reaching our um, doc healthcare providers as well as patients ultimately is really driven through uh, the uh, uh, developments in data and technology. And a fourth priority for us is recognizing that it's amazing people at GSK that make all of this happen. So the personal productivity and the personal impact that we can help each of our people, uh, you know, really adopt data and technology into the work that they do and ensuring that um, all the innovation that's happening in the future of work uh, you know, comes to bear for our people is a fourth priority for us. Are you able to go into any more kind of detail in terms of how some of those data-driven decisions that you're making are, are making a difference at GSK? Yeah. So, for example, in R&D, as I said, we um, in drug discovery, data and technology really helps us prioritize novel targets by really understanding the genetic evidence, the causal genes that, um, that really, um, you know, sometimes marks these diseases. And we have, uh, just in 2022, we've had uh, 45 validated, uh, data-driven validated targets, uh, which is a five-fold increase than what we used to have in 2017. So that's an example of where in drug discovery, data-driven discovery is a core part of our approach to, um, approach to science. In clinical development, we get very specific about using data and technology in uh, in revolutionize you know completely revolutionizing how we think about um, document authoring, which is we generate a ton of documents. So we are thinking about how to use generative AI in the process of doing that. We think about how we use data um, to really model scenarios out to design better clinical trials, as well as optimize the clinical trial protocols, etc. So throughout the clinical development process as well, we adopt data as well as technology. And in uh, manufacturing, we have very specific examples of success with what we call digital twins, which allow us to really model real-time manufacturing scenarios. And we've had a success in one of our respiratory medicines where we have 10% uh, uh, more productivity in, in the yield of that medicine through the use of these digital twins. We have examples of just uh, over a million extra doses of our sh shingles vaccine that we are able to bring forward uh, so that it can help uh, you know prevent uh, shingles for adults who need you know who, who suffer from a really terrible disease all of this is made possible through the use of data as well as AI across the board and we can go on with examples more and more but basically throughout the uh, value chain we deploy data and technology mm -hmm. in, in, in various ways interesting Alex you were nodding along to that's Almost really, everything there that Shobi was saying does no, it's that resonate to with hear, yeah you know, to, to hear its usage yeah. you know within a company like GSK you know the, the front end of of development R and D looking for pattern recognition understanding disease is incredible um, you know and I'm also thinking about um, 
when it comes to the, the larger agenda. And what, I, what do I mean by that? You know, the UN, the World Economic Forum, the big you know, powerhouses of thinking are driving you know, the new way of work in the new world. You know, we could call it Industry 5.0, for example, where we've been in a situation of Industry 4.0. So I'm talking almost more wider now than just the pharmaceutical industry, because I think for me, the pharmaceutical industry is leading the way in many aspects of AI and the usage of data. But if we look at the, the broader spectrum of, of industry, you know, I think people are moving away from a profit-centric, um, efficiency, process-driven organization to a human-centric, well, you know, well-being um, organization where you know, empowering people to make decisions with data and being resilient to any change that's there will, will enable you know, these things to occur. I mean, if we are looking about the speed of progress again and, and t touching on that point, you know, you were mentioning fit 45 you know, validations, you know, the, the speed in which you can you know, use machine learning and AI to improve your outcomes, you know, really in, empowering people you know, for accountability of outcome, but saying here's all of the information at your fingertips. You know, the comparison might be you know, the Googles of this world. You know, I was thinking, I, I remember as a child looking at the Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Britannica on, on a CD to try and get my facts, but now I can talk to a phone and it will give me a very distinct answer immediately. It draws the same comparison with the usage of that information within, in, within industry or within um, a, a company. And I think that's where we're seeing you know, a real shift you know, um, towards um, outcomes that are, are more social, um, you know, they call them the triple P's, they are more driven by you know, planet, people and profit. But we're seeing a, a real shift, I think, towards that. And, and it's, it's a new agenda. It's, it's, a, new, it's a new way of thinking. Um, and I think that's where, you know, what is it all, how do we do it? Well, we can, you know, you can empower, um, let's say, processes and systems, but that's fine. We're beyond that. You know, what, what is it about the people that, that drives this? Yeah. Well, I'm going to pick, pick you up on that, because what about the, the, the first P that you mentioned there, the planet? I mean, how... You know those external factors that that are impacting on businesses. How can they, you know a data driven approach so solve, solve those problems? Well, I, I think we're seeing the, the shift already. You know, let's think about data. So, what is the climate change agenda in regards to data? Well, we're looking at the development of carbon credits, carbon trading. You know, it's, um, social credit. You know, how can that be linked to your financial ledgers? You know, that's going to happen. How, how do we look at your credit score of, of you know, your social your corporate responsibility? That's going to be logged as part of a ledger. It's not just your finance anymore. And that's going to be you know, pinned or combined with your financial data or your other data and scored out. Um, and that's happening. And I think the, the, the green ledger within the SAP world, you know, that's, that's something that's here um, and is being pushed. And that, that will, that's already you know, the agenda right. And likewise, um, Combining data sets together and being able to you know, look at patterns that you haven't been able to yet recognize to understand how you might improve your KPIs or let's say your key drivers of, of sustainability, that's another thing. You know, um, if we move away from, um, let's say, the channeled way of thinking of process to say, I've got everything here, what is it that I can do to improve? And I think you touched on that in your last point. You know, there are, there are loads of things you can start to find to improve upon, you know, um, machine learning of, of your, your production, your manufacturing. You know, um, we find, as an example, that you can produce, you know, at night, this particular product for less energy, you know, to still meet demand. Well, that's all through analytics. How do we know that? Well, it's power demand against, you know, the amount of units produced. The, the, these data sets combined can give you all sorts of, uh, insights you didn't have before. And I think it's the time for data scientists to step up. The, the, the nerds are re revolting. Uh, so, uh, you know, the revolution of, of, of um, yeah, the, the data scientists, I'd say. Shelby, thoughts on that? Sustainability, climate change, how data can, you know, work with that? Yeah, I, I think fundamentally, um, uh, we are being held to incredibly um, high standards, and rightly so. Uh, that we do the right thing by all our stakeholders. And I think most companies have developed sensible ESG agendas that allow us to um, 
really own our responsibility in authentic ways. And different industries have different approaches to what is their unique contribution. So for example, for us, access to medicines is something that we can uniquely contribute to when it comes to um, uh, 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 overall ESG agenda. We are uh, committed to making our supply chain um, sustainability friendly, and we have signed up for very specific targets around that as well. And all of this is underpinned by sensible, clean data and making sure that we are able to make very data-driven decisions that's responsible for our company, whether it's uh, you know uh, diversity of clinical trials or access to our medicines or sustainability, et cetera. And uh, from a technology standpoint, all of us uh, and many of my peers, we talk about this, uh, have gone on a um, very responsible agenda to think about how uh, the technology choices that we make also impact sustainability. For example, at GSK, we are moving an, almost all of our data center footprint into, the, cl into um, the cloud, as we call it. And all the hyperscalers have signed up for very ambitious sustainability goals as well. So we make supplier choices as well, very thoughtfully, now taking into account sustainability. So it's almost like um, you talked about data-driven decision-making. Sustainability-driven decision-making has also become a big part of how uh, how we do business and data informs almost all of it, uh, I would say. Ashobi, we, we touched on this earlier, actually, in terms of the speed of, of development. I was just keen to understand how you cope, you know, with how quickly technology is, is accelerating, but also how you integrate good data practice in, into such a large organization such as GSK. Yeah, I think I'll probably answer your second question first. And uh, we believe that data and technology is just a uh, a tool in the human toolkit to achieve the innovation and the performance and uh, and the trust agenda that we have for our company. And um, therefore, we've made significant investment and have placed uh, an enormous amount of focus on developing our people and ensuring that we are increasing the digital fluency and the data fluency of our company broadly. And that involves you know, providing learning pathways and skills development and um, an opportunity to really come together as a community to share what we've learned, get inspired, understand why this is important. So uh, three years ago, we started this internal a data conference called DataCon, uh, where we brought together 400 uh, data and analytics practitioners. Uh, you, you'll appreciate this, Alex. Uh, you know, together to just talk about they w come from different walks of life. How did they? Uh, how do they use data? What are the barriers? What are the challenges they face? Do they understand the big picture? Uh, so we did this as just a little experiment three years ago, and this year for our DataCon 2023, there were over 7,000 people, nearly 10% of GSK, volunteer signed up to get educated on generative AI and how to get better at prompt engineering and using GPTs, uh, that chat GPT to better solve problems and what is cybersecurity, what does it mean to do responsible AI. And there was this enormous hunger from the organization to learn and that is hugely inspiring and probably feeds my uh, energy to keep uh, going with this as well. So an investment in people is a big part of really scaling the use of uh, data, but also good practices across the organization. In terms of keeping up with um, with uh, with changing technology, I just think this is the world we live in. And it's, if anything, the pace of change is going to accelerate even further. And we're going to see that some of the innovation in AI is going to create the next level of release in capabilities that were probably stuck, like uh, spatial computing, which is, you know, we saw the Google Glasses <laughs> and talked about it, but it's never really come to life. But now the ability for AI to make technology more ambient means some of these other um, innovations like spatial spatial computing, uh, as well as neuro technology, etc., are all going to come into play much more um, much more faster. And uh, therefore, I sort of um, I have a favorite author uh, called Peter Hinson, who talks about, he used to talk about the new normal, and now he talks about the never normal. And that's the world data data leaders and technology leaders live in, is that uh, you get you learn to embrace the never normal mm. in some ways. So what about in terms of the leadership, though? So you talk about this conference, which sounds amazing, 7,000 people. How does leadership have to change their working practices? Yeah, I um, 
have another good friend and a futurist uh, named Bob Johansson, who, um, when we talk about uh, operating in what we call the VUCA world, the uh, you know, volatile, the yeah. un unpredict unpredictable, yeah. complex and ambiguous world, uh, he talks about the importance of leadership uh, and uh, he says that the future will um, reward clarity and punish certainty. So it's really important for leaders to be really clear about where we are going, but in maintain this incredible agility to adapt to the uh, ever-changing world around us uh, in terms of how we get there. And I think a second probably not appreciated trait of leadership is to bring focus. Uh, say we're going to work on these things, we're not going to work on these things. These things are important to the company, these things are not. And it's hard to do. I find it hard to do in my day job every, you know, to keep the focus on what matters. And I think that's going to be incredibly important as well to thrive in a never normal world. So from the never normal perspective, <clears throat> my take on it would be, you know, if we, we take the example of, let's say, COVID as you know, a, a, a seismic shift, a pivot into the way people work, you know, the, the four day um, week, the three day week, working from the office or not, the, the speed in which that occurred uh, and the way people had to adapt was a, a very good exercise to understand how, you know, how to set up. And I think to Shobi's point, you know, it's all about the people um, because, you know, you, you need to make sure your infrastructure, your technology, your data is enabling and empowering um, people to have accountability within your business to, to drive change. Um, it, it's, it shouldn't be an anchor, it shouldn't inhibit. It should always drive um, the success of what you're doing. And the resilience, there's, there's, that goes arm in arm with that technology development because if you are planning, and as Shobi said, for a clear vision and clarity, um, then it has to be resilient. It's not trying to predict and being arrogant on, I know what the future's gonna hold. It's, are we ready to you know, be resilient for whatever we, we, you know, is coming? Mm. Yeah. I wanna move on to the topic of AI. You've touched on it quite a, a few times. Um, I'm keen to understand how you approach its adoption, um, but also on, on the ethical side. Um, I mean, I'd, just to give an example, just before recording this, this podcast this week, there was a podcast platform that decided to use an AI tool to change all the automatically to change the descriptions of all the podcasts on its feed. However, those podcasts are all generated by podcast producers like us. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly, without the permission of all those podcast producers, they've changed all the descriptions. They've had to then change it back again. I won't go into too much detail on it. <laughs> but that's on the kind of, you know, that's just producing a podcast. In the pharmaceutical world, I would have thought there's a few more ethical, you know, decisions that have to be accounted for when using things like AI. How, how do you how do you approach the whole adoption of it? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. I think um, the first thing I'll I'll say is that AI is not new to our industry. As we talked earlier, uh, we've spent nearly the past five years building capabilities to focus on how AI ML can help us process enormous amounts of data at pace and help us generate targets that are more better validated, as I said earlier. So we've invested in early discovery uh, and in-house capabilities in AI as well quite a bit. And now we are um, scaling AI across the company, as I said, for clinical development, for supply chain, for commercial engagement, as well as general enterprise productivity. So um, I think uh, it's going to be a technology that we care about uh, quite deeply. And this trend will continue, and I fundamentally believe that data and AI will, will in the long term, fundamentally change how we discover, develop, and bring medicines to life. And uh, I like to uh, you know, say that we will always overestimate the potential of some of these new technologies in the short term, and we will underestimate the potential of these technologies in the long term. So we have begun the journey, and we are very committed to it. Uh, for me, there are three things when it comes to the adoption of AI, and the ethical consideration is definitely one of the top priorities for us. The first one is there is no AI if there's no good data. And um, uh, so 
thinking about how to generate, how to license, how to buy, uh, how to integrate and clean all this data and provision it at scale for you know amazing um, AI ML technologists and scientists and uh, supply chain leaders, et cetera, to make sense of it is a big priority for us. So creating that data infrastructure that allows us to do good AI is really important in what I call playing offense with AI, which is playing to win with opportunities. The second bit is um, is the uh, defensive considerations, which is if you want to drive a fast car, you need really good brakes. And uh, we think about um, the ethics. Uh, we set up, just even as we started doing AI, we set up uh, our uh, a, a dedicated role for ethics and policies, uh, not just what we develop and consider internally, but also the responsibility we have to influence and advise governments and decision makers on how to adopt responsible AI policies. So we think about that quite a bit. And we have set up a AI governance council that brings people from all walks of life, from legal, from IP, from uh, compliance, from uh, regulatory, from uh, information security, from a technology standpoint, just bringing and practitioners, actual practitioners of AI together to think about how we adopt AI responsibly. What do we issue as guidelines to builders of AI within the company? How do we tell people when they procure things uh, like a platform that actually uses AI to do something that we never used to use AI for before, like recruiting. How do we do that responsibly? So that the ethical considerations and what we call responsible AI is a very, very important priority for us. And the third one, as always, comes down to talent. Like, do you have the right skills? Do you have enough people who understand how to do this well and responsibly? And so investing in the capabilities that we have to build out is a huge part of our priority as well. So data, responsible AI and talent. Alex, how do you see AI transforming, you know, the way businesses operate? Well, I think, you know, we're already seeing you know, AI being adopted to, to Shavi's point, you know, within the pharmaceutical industry, you know, it's been used for great results so far. You know, when we're looking at, you know, cross industry, so the horizontal, you've already got, you know, um, repetitive tasks being automated. You have chatbots, you have the ability for content or, or, or data that's been you know, it's clearly defined to, 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 to bring back data to help with, you know, I think you can you know, get content created, you can get content edited, checked. You know, um, and also, you know, we're seeing that the, the move into you know, things like contracts and unstructured data, you know, where you've got documents, you can get you know, AI to look at commonalities, cluster things and understand if your contracts are correct. Likewise, you know, wearable tech, I think we touched on that a little bit to say if you have someone w w wandering around a factory floor, you have AI potentially predicting when assets or certain things need replacing, looking at a particular part of your manufacturing mill and saying that's red, we might need to replace that. You're not scheduling in old ways of working, you have someone with Google glasses on looking at something glowing red, right, I need to get that fixed. You know, th this, uh, this is very, you know, th this is now and it's happening. I think to uh, Shobi's point around, you know, policy and governance, fundamental. Um, you know, with anything with data, if we're looking at uh, pre-AI, let's say, you know, data needs to be structured. You need to know who owns it, where it is, um, well categorised and have governance and policy around that. You know, an example would be GDPR, you know, European Data Protection Regulation. That's something that's well formed now. But within the AI space, in regulation, I might have said earlier, is, is playing catch up. So to Shobi's point, who do we need in the room? to make a governance policy or, or have an info, a, a policy in regards to AI now. You know, how are we feeding that back to other industries or to governments? Because this is all learning, this is the frontier, but we have to be responsible. And that means being ethical, following your company's ethics and also feeding back into the wider AI debate. And this thing about um, following your company's culture and mm. values, like one of our core values is doing the right thing. And that sort of um, allows you to think about, it doesn't matter whether you're doing AI today yeah. or the next best technology tomorrow, it has to be really anchored in, in who you are as a company and what your values are. And that's very powerful. So we've launched an AI code that connects it back to our core code of, core of, code of conduct in the company. So making it really clear to people that you have to really adopt it as, a, as you would any other uh, capability in the company. 
So really important to a yeah, lot of culture. Just, just thinking well. that, you know, you could almost have, you know, as people are doing tasks on, on a system or process, you could actually have bots going and saying, hang on, are you aware of this policy in this area? This is the great thing about it. Right. You know, it could be innovative like this, saying that could be a good idea. Now, then you go back to the AI forum, as you said, the, the group of 7,000 people to say, would this help people? OK, let, let's put it into beta. Let's get it out there. I think that agility and speed is the thing that's so exciting, coming back to some of the earlier questions. I think um, the fact that the two of you keep adding new examples as, as, you're, as you're going along just shows how you know, huge and, and the breadth that, that, that can be covered by, by this topic. I, I know we're short of time, though, unfortunately. So I'd, I'd just like to finish off by just getting both of your views on, on I, I guess, what's going to be the key to achieving the business advantage that you know, obviously everyone is seeking over the, the coming years, whether that's six to 12 months or the next five years, how, however you want to kind of predict it. But Alex, so should we uh, start with you on that one? Yeah, I think putting research and innovation, you know, especially within AI, at the forefront or the transformation, you know, strat the the transformation forefront in in making sure you have a human centric and resilient industry is really important. So as I touched on earlier, having the AI vision, the technology vision. Um, and making sure that's fully arm in arm and standing alongside your business strategy and interacting with that as you move forward is imperative. Shobi? Yeah, I think three things. Alignment to your core purpose. So what you're doing has to be aligned to who you are and what you do. Uh, recognition and sponsorship from the top of the house that this is important and this is why we're doing it. Uh, this is why we want to be a data-driven company. is really important to capture um, the energy and the passion of the people uh, to adopt it. And uh, the third thing I would say is uh, talent that will get you there. Without that, you're not going get, to uh, get to the outcomes. Tremendous. Uh, we have covered a, a huge amount. Um, Alex, if anyone listening, watching wants to get any more information on any of the topics we've covered, what was the best place for them to go? Yeah, so um, probably to our website. So it's snpgroup.com. And also, I'm very happy to take emails on any, anything data. Uh, I think, you know, it's been my passion for nearly 19 years now. So, yeah, I'm happy to talk to anyone that wants to get in contact. Fantastic. Shobi Ramakrishnan and Alex Smith, uh, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and insights. Uh, we hope that you have enjoyed this episode. Um, please do follow us uh, wherever you get your podcasts. And if you want to contribute to the discussion, uh, you can find the C-Suite podcast on LinkedIn and all the usual social channels. Uh, thanks once again to our partners uh, for this episode, SMP and to GSK for hosting us. Uh, finally, if you would like to get in touch with the show, uh, you can do that via the contact form at the website at csuitepodcast.com. But for now, from me, Russell Goldsmith, uh, thanks very much for listening or watching the show on YouTube and goodbye. <laughs>